Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman here, and he's the best storyteller in the game, and it's time to sit back, relax, and have some laughs. Welcome to the Mayor's Office, and here's your host, Sean Casey. Chichi, let's back go, in, baby. Back let's at go, it baby. with an all-star, <laughs> one of our all-star guys oh, today. Let's go, dude. Th- this is what I love about this show. I almost, I feel like I say it every week, but man, I tell you what, when you get a guy like this who's great friends with both of ours, who's you know, obviously done some unbelievable things. But before we bring him in, let's let's inter- let's give him a proper introduction. Absolutely. 18, 18 years in the show, three-time all-star in the Brewers Wall of Honor, NC State Hall of Fame in two thousand ten, over a thousand games franchise record for the Brewers and ERA saves games played uh this guy's literally one of the best analysts out there he's been at MLB Network 14 years he's also been in the booth for a while but I tell you what man when you talk about Dan Plesak you got to talk about one of the best dudes you'll ever meet man to man so let's, let's bring him in our friend and one of the best in the business Danny Plesak yeah, what's up Zach? Danny oh. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting the ring at the Olympics right now. Yes. Okay. Come on, Sean. Point to your stoop, baby. Let's do this. There he is. Yes. Also, I'll say as a producer, the number one, number one Swiss Army knife weapon in all of analysis. You got a serious show. You got to do something serious. You need Dan Plesak on your desk. You got a show where you want to see a guy act like that. You need Dan Plesak on your desk. <laughs> Best in the business, baby. <laughs> hey, Sack, you're ready to go, bro. Like, oh, the one thing before we get going, you're dressed like you just golfed 18 or 36, <laughs> which I know you probably did. So, I, t- I, I didn't today. <laughs> This was the uh, day off. We got opening day coming up in a few days, right? This was, I've got up late and I'm like, I really don't feel like doing much. I'm thinking, Sean Casey, I put a suit and tie on. He's going to look at me like, what's wrong with you? So I went to casual look. So the casual look. Nice. Hey, Zach, tell us about your, your, your golf game right now, bro, because I'm not kidding you. I've seen it. When I first got to the network, you were, you were, you know, pretty good golfer now you're like 68 60 you're obsessed you're obsessed yeah you know what happened like i moved out here kind of like everybody you go through these transformations in life i came out to move to new jersey became a member at a country club and i got tired of shooting like 92 on saturday 83 <laughs> on sunday and then the next week it could be 79 on wednesday and then 104 on thursday so i broke down case i finally broke down you know as a guy it's like you don't want to ask for directions i, I took a package of 10 lessons to learn how to hold the club the grip the swing the mechanics and i fight with it since case wow. i will say this for 21 years professionally 18 at the big league level three at the minor league level I beat myself up every night, going back to your room, go looking in the mirror, looking at your delivery. <laughs> out. Am I landing on my front foot? What am I doing? Am I getting a proper reach? I do the same thing with a golf club. Yeah. Now, you see me walking around MLB Network, like one of those lunatics walking through the park. I'm like, going, <laughs> going through a golf swing, walking across the street, we hawk in New Jersey. <laughs> guys, are, guys and women are looking at me like, what is this guy? Is he I have everything but the white jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Zach, Zach, I know because the one time a couple years ago, you, me, and Amzinger played, and I'm I'm the guy, you're like, oh, yeah, 70. I'm the guy that's like 120 on Monday, 136 on Wednesday, 90, maybe a, a 101. But I played with you the one time, and, and, and Zach, you were, you were locked in, bro. It was three hours, four hours of just like – dissecting every shot i was like I, my head was spinning at the end of that round i was like oh my god danny's so stressed out i don't know what to do you know what i'm i'm so much like you in a lot of ways like you and i like during the course of the baseball day i think we both looked at baseball the same way like yeah i don't think two guys other than me and you love to play more than you and i did and what we meant by loving it like getting the ballpark early and being there with the guys <sighs> having a donut, getting on the field, going to the cage, sweating. But you enjoyed – but there was a part that once it started, you were locked in. Like there was – you know, a guy would come to first base, you would say hi, and, you know, you'd joke around. But, man, when when you were standing in the batter's box, there was – I as fun-loving guy as you were, I don't ever remember a time you walked up to the plate laughing and joking, maybe in spring training, not during a game. Work is work. And you know what? That's kind of what's carried. That's what golf has been to me. Mm. I wish it wasn't 
But Case, I, I, I'm either all in or I'm out. Right. And golf, I'm in. And so, like, I have fun warming up and playing and walking in between shots. But, like, when I'm getting ready to hit a shot, like, that baseball light turns on. Like, okay, how far am I? What club am I going to use? The green's from left to right. Where do I want to be? I don't want to be in that bunker. And it all starts going. So, I apologize that day because you're probably <laughs> trying to have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Geez, what this guy do? Swallow the radio? Shut up!" <laughs> you turned around one time. I was talking to Amazon in your backswing. He looked at me like you're gonna kill me. Like, "Case, you're talking about backswing." I was like, "Holy crap! I didn't know this was Augusta." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Hey, man, you got your MLB shirt. You're gonna have a four iron wrapped around your neck." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god sec it's so great dude dude so you talk about being all in and 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 you are man like like uh, that's what i love about you bro like like even when you're on air man like there's nobody that you know breaks down teams better nobody th- th- breaks down the pitching when you played you know even when you when you were dominant early on but even at the end of your career when you didn't have the same stuff you still knew how to pitch and how to compete can you take us back to gary indiana you growing up dan please sack you know looking into things bro and we've had conversations before you weren't even that big of a baseball player like you were more of a hooper and that was kind of your direction of where you were heading in college and nc state can you talk about that how did you start to play baseball and when did you feel like you were all in in baseball you know sean it's funny when you do what you and i have done that people just expect that because (laughs) the way things are today that we were on aau youth teams and we traveled all over the place sean i literally grew up in in a one bedroom i had two brothers my older brother joe had the top bunk i shared a bunk bed with my brother ron Till I was 15 years old, we lived in Gary, Indiana, very much like Patterson, New Jersey, a very urban kind of area, Steel Mill City, a lot like Pittsburgh. There are some good areas in the Berg and there are some not so good areas. Gary at one time in the 50s and 60s was a vibrant place. It was the melting pot of the world, the steel industry. When the steel industry went bad, Gary kind of turned the other way. But I'll say this, Sean. I had a great childhood. I, I didn't have, a, I didn't ever own a car till I signed with Milwaukee. Um, but I always knew that like on Christmas, I got a Boston Bruins Jersey, a Blackhawks Jersey, whatever my mom and dad could afford for me to have. We had, if I wanted a new glove, I didn't get a new glove and a sled and a bike and something else. If I really wanted a glove, I got a glove. And what I tried to do, I played for 18 years. And every year, it goes back to three words for me, East Glen Park. That was the Little League that I really started to play in. And, Sean, every year before I leave to go to spring training, and I get a little choked up talking about it, I would drive by East Glen Park Little League because that's where it started for me. And I looked at that field, and like the house when you were a kid, I imagined those three fields that were kind of like a spring training complex but much smaller. And I thought the grass was beautifully green, To hit a ball, I remember I was eight years old. The first time I hit a ball over the fence, 200 feet, right? And then I thought I was Billy Williams, man. I thought I was standing. (laughs) I hit one over the fence. And I would go back every year, and I looked at those three fields. And grass was knee high. The fences were falling down. The grandstand where you would be concession stand. There were bars where we used to fight. I got a great story for you. When I was 10 years old, there was a great player in Gary, Indiana, and you know him, Lloyd McClendon. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. The, greatest, the greatest Little League player ever. <laughs> like, almost hit in a bat every time at Williamsport in the Little League World Series. So we found out that Lloyd McClendon, Midtown Little League, part of Gary, was coming to East Glen Park. <sighs> and so you were able to get 10 cents or a snow cone if a guy hit a home run and you wanted to get that ball. So when Lloyd McClendon came up, and I'm telling you this, and every time I see him, I say, when Lloyd McClendon came up, I rode my bike to the Little League field. It was like, man, that's Lloyd McClendon. When he hit a, a, a bundle of kids, I would say 15 to 20 kids would all go beyond the left field fence because when he hit the ball out, you wanted to get that ball and take it back, and you got a snow cone for getting that ball. Oh. And for 18 years in the big leagues, I drove back to that field. and I Because, Sean, that's where it all started for me. That, mm. that started for me in a day and age where I'm sure like you – when you had five guys and you didn't have enough to make the whole field. And I was a lefty. So I would pitch and we would have a third baseman, a third baseman and a left fielder. Well, when I came to bat guys didn't want to switch over. So the pitcher would throw from third base 
and I had the, the center part of the field to hit from. And, and you know, when you think about it, when you really love the game, you love the game when you were eight, you loved wearing, getting dirty, you loved sliding. That first time you hit one over the fence, the first time you struck somebody out and you knew what it felt like. And, and, and life was simple then. And, and we weren't chasing the next thing right away. And, and I tried to every year before I left for spring training, I made a drive down Virginia Street, 4456 Virginia Street in Gary, Indiana, looked at that small house I grew up in and drove two blocks up to East Glen Park Little League. And I looked at that Little League and it looked like the size of a shoebox. But when I was eight through 12, Sean, that was like PNC Park in the Berg. That was right. my life. It was my life. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing when you look back, Danny? And, you, you know, I, I still – I live in the town that I grew up in, and I drive by – I just told my daughter the other day because they didn't see me as a big leaguer, but I'm like, hey, your dad – oh, no, my daughter says, Dad, you ever hit a home run out of that park? I was like, yeah, I did, 11 years old, and I hit a white Camaro driving by, and the guy <laughs> pulled in and was like, who the hell hit the ball? I was like, scared to death. I'm hiding in the dugout. I'm like, hey, man, don't drive by when I'm hitting. But, you know what I mean? I, I – still drive by that Danny and I go wow that's where it all started like it was 12 years in the big leagues and all that stuff but like the memories that I have from that from that that field is unbelievable and I, I think for you too Danny like did when you were in the big leagues like looking back you know you always you were so humble and you still are to, to this day do you feel like those memories for you kind of kept you to a place where when I was in the big leagues you know you kept that humility the factor I did you know Shauna I was so lucky I went to spring training in 1986 with the Milwaukee Brewers, and this was the end of Harvey's wall bangers. So this was Robin Yount, Paul Mauter, Cecil Cooper, Jim Gantner, Ed Simmons, Pete Vuk. Wow. wow. I mean, I mean, stars, right? And so I, I make the team. I never pitched in triple. I make the team out of double A. We opened the season in April of 86 <laughs> in Chicago against the White Sox. That's the team I grew up loving. And I can remember this. I can remember – going to a doubleheader game with the White Sox and the Boston Red Sox. That's going to lead to part two of my story. <laughs> and I remember being, being, going to those games and that field seemed so big. And on opening day, you have your name called out. You run out on the foul line in old Comiskey Park. And I was like, I'm here. Like, I'm here. And all wow. I can remember, standing on the foul line, and they were introducing the White Sox. My favorite player as a kid was Harold Baines. Harold Baines, to me, walked on water. And when they did the announcement, the Brewers re-ran out first, and now they do the starting lineup for the White Sox. And Harold Baines ran out. And, I mean, I was like – I wanted, almost wanted to cry. I'm like, man, that's Harold Baines. And then number 72, Carlton Fisk, because he had changed uniforms. He was 27 with the Red Sox. That wasn't available, so he changed it to 72. And when I saw him, I saw Carlton Fisk and Harold wow. Baines. I was like – Man, I made it. I made wow. it. I arrived. You wow. Know, it, it just it just stuff like that, Sean, that I, I look back at it now and it, it was a wonderful time in my life. It was a wonderful time when you have your parents and your friends and kids you played Little League ball with with you to enjoy that ride. And that's what makes it great. And to this day, you know, my mom is still alive. My dad's passed. My mom texts me every morning. Hey, what time are you on the air? And, and I, I will say this, when I retired, the crazy part, I think my mom took it worse than I did because <laughs> it gives yeah. your parents something every day, you know, not, not necessarily anymore with the social media and, and the phone, but to get up and look at the paper, look at the box scores for your mom and dad to see if, you, hey, what did you do last night in LA? Did you get a hit when you played? Because they can't watch every game when you and I played. There, there wasn't that worldwide cable, like you could buy the MLB package and watch every game. You know, you played in Cincinnati. If you guys were playing, yeah, playing out in the Bay or in San Fran, if it wasn't on ESPN, your mom and dad weren't watching the game. Right. And plus, yep. even if you go further back, I always look back. I loved when I played as a kid. Like your, I bet your mom has great friends because she sat next to your friends playing baseball all those years, and all the moms that become friends with each other in a community of people that you know they're they're all taking you guys to the games, driving all the parks and everything, and then. It, it must be tough for a parent. I remember when I stopped playing in college, like my parents were like, well, what are we going to do now? <laughs> like, like, <you> know? <laughs> it's true. It is. I mean, you don't realize when you're doing it, how many lives you affect, mm. like on the peripherals, your mom, your dad, your friends, the buddy you had 
it's amazing that I'm sure you went through this, Sean, where you would be in Cincinnati and some guy would walk down and go, hey, Sean, remember me, man? I was on Roma's Pizza in Little League. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, like you, you, you see the face and you're like, oh, yeah. And, 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 and the thing you have to do, you have to try to do is remember those people and don't forget them. You, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of times the first impression that somebody has of you, they get a chance to meet Sean Casey. You, 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 you try to always with a smile and shake their hand and look them in the eye. And it goes a long way, man. It, it yeah. just, you know, I don't miss playing, Sean. Right. I don't miss playing. But you know what I miss? I miss Sunday morning in Fenway. When you're a visiting team and the Red Sox are taking BP and you're stretching and it's a warm, sunny day and, you know, you're kind of tired and you run out and stand BP and I would stand with my back up against the monster and I would just stand there and lean up and I'd look in the crowd of people and you see a mom and a dad with a kid and their kids and one's got a Red Sox hat on, the other one's got a glove and you're standing there and you're thinking, you know, like, We all do this in every walk of life. Like, ah, I'm so tired. We got another road trip. I hate going on the West Coast. Haven't had a day off in 12 days. But then every once in a while, I I miss standing with my back up looking at the monster and thinking, this is where Carlton Fisk hit that ball. This is where Bucky Dent hit that ball. How lucky am I to be sitting here and standing here right now? And like the little things that you do, like a ball comes out to you and you get it, you put it in your pocket because you see one boy or one girl that are over there and they're waving like, give me a ball. And then after BP's over, you walk over that way. And, you know, you say, Hey, what's your name, Bob? Hey, Bob, are you rooting for the Red Sox or the Brewers? Ah, for the Red Sox. That's okay. Here. And you give him the ball and his dad says, Hey, can you sign it for him? And you sign it for him. And you see his dad, like hit the bill of his hat and hug his son. And that's when you walk away and you go, that's why you do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do it for the, for the playing, but you do it because you're giving something back to. Yeah. Dude, I, 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 it's so awesome that you're saying that because, you know, I was I was talking to some kids the other day, a high school team, and I was saying you're saying to them, what's the purpose? What, what, you know, we all need purpose. We're you know, what's your purpose for playing? And I remember my dad used to send me same thing to me. He's like, are you? He he said, are you going to play in the big leagues because you want to make money and be famous? Are you going to play in the big leagues because you have a chance to impact people? And I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense, Dad. And and like you said, Zach. You don't know what what father and and daughter and and mom or family is going to be coming to the game that day. I used to th- I used to say to myself, I got to play as hard as I can today because it might be the one time that this kid's coming to see me play and and, and get after it. I, I know exactly that feeling. What you're saying, like you miss that interaction, you miss being able to impact a kid just by giving them a ball or being in Milwaukee or where, where all the years you played, Danny, punching out somebody to save a game, and here goes fifty thousand people going going nuts. I mean, there's something to be said about that it is and and another thing too like what when you get out of playing like there's something sean about winning the day like you know this because you've been through this grind when you get up august 12th and you're in pittsburgh and you're on a road trip and it's hot it's muggy and you have a saturday day game and you're so tired and you get up at eight o'clock wake up call you're going to take a cab you're going to take the bus and you get to the field and your body it's telling you not today, like, but there's something inside of you that says, no, like in the next thing, you know, you're in the weight room, you're doing elliptical, you're doing cardio, you're out in BP, you're bursting in sweat and you come back after BP and you're like, okay, I didn't give in today. Like right. it's so easy when you start like, ah, but you know what? There's something about the guys that do it long, that stay long guys that can do this for eight, 10, 12, 15 years. There's a method to it. Like you have to love the grind. You have to mm. be tired to sweat and you have to be able to tell your body that quitting and being tired is not an option. Right. Well, Danny, take us back, man, to when you got drafted by the Brewers in 83. You were drafted first off by the Cardinals. I was. In, in 19, oh. and like in early too. Can you take us back to that? Can you take us back to that story? Never pitched a game <laughs> from my sophomore, junior to my senior year. Signed a national <laughs> level intent. I'm going to NC State to play basketball. Norm Slow, Monty Kyle, they recruited me. I'm all set and done. Baseball season starts. I was picked to play in the Indiana Illinois High School All Star game. If I played in the game, I was ineligible to a spring sport. I thought, hey, I've got a full ride to NC State. I don't need to play in the game. Cheers. I'm going to play baseball. First base outfield. 
our manager, our coach, then Dick Webb says, Hey, we've got a problem. We're not any good. We don't have any pitchers. Can you pitch? I'm like, ah, <laughs> uh, Curly. I did this like in seventh and eighth grade. I was the tall lefty through hard. I'm like, okay, I'll pitch. One game turned into like 15 punch outs, then another hitter, <laughs> then 18. All of a sudden, like by game six, there's like eight scouts behind. <laughs> I don't have any idea. My last wow. start before the draft, there's like 30 scouts there. <laughs> and I'm all of a sudden, I get drafted. I was the 42nd player. Wow. Sean, my mother, my mom has a newspaper article I told when I got drafted. They asked me what my arsenal was. I said, well, right now I throw fastball, knuckleball. <laughs> I'm telling you, I didn't have a curveball. Wow. I didn't have a slider. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. So <sighs> they offered me $25,000. That was the offer. I was the 42nd player. Oh, my gosh. So I'm like, I'm not going to take this. So the first round pick from the Cardinals was a guy named Don Collins, right-handed pitcher from Virginia Beach, Virginia. He signed for 50. I told the Cardinals, I want 50 in that incentive package program. You know where you got like <laughs> 2000 for getting a double A. Plane ticket. Yeah. Yeah, 7500 I said, I wanted 50 in the incentive <clears throat> package. They're like, we can't give you more than the first round pick. I said, yeah. okay, fine. I, I'm not going to go. A week before I'm a roll at NC State, they called back again. Dell Maxville was the GM. They called my house and they said, "What's it going to take?" I said, "It's going to take 50 in the incentive package." They said, "Okay, you got it." Oh was, no! What? what? So, <laughs> we'll be in Crown Point, Indiana tomorrow. Oh my god! So I am like, now they call my bluff. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I don't even know what a curveball. I don't even know what a standing mound. I'm like. Oh, 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 I'm like, I'm swimming without floating. <laughs> well, wait, but Danny, Danny, when you were in high school and you're taking outfield as a junior and you're in right field, like, what took them so long to make you a pitcher? I can only assume that you were throwing 100 miles per hour from right field to third base, weren't you? Like, Winfield. They begged me. I didn't want to do it. Really? I, like, oh. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Ah. So, the, so Mo Mazzelli. And Del Maxwell drive to my house the next morning. That night, my mom said to me, you've got to make the decision. You're the one. If you don't feel you're ready, you got to tell him. Don't worry about my dad worked in the steel mill. My dad was gung-ho. He was, hey, sign, get the money. <laughs> take the money. Yeah. Take go, the money. Go play baseball and go. He walked in, and I just knew that. It, I, just, I just knew. It wasn't meant to be. And I remember telling him, Mr. Mazzelli, Mr. Maxwell, I'm sorry, but it's just this isn't the right time. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where to stand on the mound. I don't know how to hold a curveball. Said, no, we're going to teach you how to do that. That's what our job is. And I was like, and I said, no. Mo Mazzelli walked out of my house. He stopped. He shook my hand. And he said, son, you may ever see that kind of money again the rest of your life. But he says, I respect your opinion. And they drove away. Wow. Drove away. I went to NC State. They switched my contract. From my, my scholarship from baseball, from basketball to baseball. Huh. I went to NC State and I was a 26 player, the last player taken in the first round with Milwaukee. So I rolled the dice and it worked. This is the crazy part about it. I signed with the Brewers and I was in Paintsville, Kentucky. Our <laughs> first game was in Johnson City, Tennessee. Guess what? Home of the Johnson City Cardinals. <laughs> I got off the bus and I'm like, this is where I would have been. Holy like, shit. I'm like, this is where I was going to be like three years oh ago. God. In Johnson oh City, Tennessee. So it, it worked out great. Danny, when they walked away, what did you think? When he said that to you, you may never see that kind of money again. Did you did you second guess yourself? I, I tell you when I did. I did on a 750 class three weeks later. And it's <laughs> yeah. I'm like, really? I'm going to an e yeah. class at 750? And I could be playing baseball right now. What the hell is wrong with you? Oh, yeah. I had a lot of, I had a line of talks with myself. Oh, yeah. Like, when I get a paper back, I get a D, and I'm like, man, I got to keep a 2.0. I'm not going to be able to play. Oh, I could have signed. Who the hell am I kidding? I'm not going to I'm not going to be a doctor. <laughs> Oh my God, so great! Oh, well, it worked out later because three years later, you're you're the first round pick of the Brewers, and your career starts with the Brewers. And you went back to that game in '86 when you you know you take the field. You got Harold Baines, you got Carlton Fish, you got some of your heroes sitting there. Can you t and you talked about your routine too, Danny? 
Who taught you how to be a big leaguer? Who are some of the guys that taught you, hey, man, you got to get a routine. You got to figure out, you know, your, your pregame, your postgame, in-game, all that stuff uh, of, the, of those early Brewer teams. You want to know when I learned it? I learned it in 1984 in A-ball. Mm. That's where I learned my lesson. Best mm. manager, the only guy that ever got through to this, you know, left-handed <laughs> a guy named Tim Nordbrook. Had a cup of coffee in the big leagues. So I signed with Milwaukee in 83, and they sent me to rookie ball, Paintsville, Kentucky. I'm in the Appalachian League. Went 9-1, and one, player of the year. But I should have been. I was a junior playing against high school kids that were all crying because they had never been away from home. So I should have been dealing in that league, right? So the next year, I'm in the California League in Stockton. I'm, I'm pitching these, uh, the California North and South. I'm the starting pitcher in the California League All-Star Game. And I am straight right now. I am, I am from the Digby tribe. Everything I'm doing, I, I'm thinking I am the man, right? I pitch in that game. I come back. And you remember the days when the starting pitcher did the bucket? Where like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, TV, the screen was there, and the guy said he threw the balls in. He put him in the bucket, and he ran him into the BP pitcher. Right. So doing the bucket. Tim Moorbrook walks up to me, and he goes, uh, hey, I got a question. He goes, you remember your first girlfriend? I said, yeah, Mary Kay Thanos. He goes, what, did you love her? I go, I don't know. He goes, well, do you think you loved her? I go, I don't know. I go, I, I was a junior. I went to prom with her. I don't know if I loved her. <laughs> and he goes, let me tell you something about baseball. You got to take your arms and you got to wrap your arms around it. And you got to hug it and hold it. He goes, you have to love baseball. 10 times more than you ever loved Mary Kay Thanos. You, you have to grab it and hold it and hold it forever. And he walked away from me. And I'm like, wow, that's odd. So for like two days, it bothered me. So I knocked on his door. I'm like, hey, Nordy, you got a minute? Yeah. I go, hey, did you just call me out the other day? He goes, damn right I did. <laughs> you don't need to be in California League. You need to be in El Paso and Double A. You wow. need to be in a Texas League. He goes, you know what the problem with you is? We tell you to be here at 10, you're there at 10. We tell you to run 20 poles, you run 20 poles. You're never here first. You're never here last. You never run 24 poles. You never run 10 sprints. If we tell you 10, you do. You never run 12. And he called me out and he goes, you got to love the game, Dan. You got to wow. look. At and you know what? He was right. I'll never forget this. Wow. We went on a road trip. Modesto, California. Went to a Barnes and Noble bookstore. I still have the book. So I walk into this bookstore. Now, I went to school for three years at NC State. I didn't know what a book was. <laughs> but I what knew was the book? What? Hey, but I could throw a heater on the box, though. <laughs> so, so I'm walking through Barnes & Noble. I'm looking at all these fiction, autobiography, sports. I'm like, hey, sports. I go by and I see, pull a book out because I saw Tom Seaver on it. I pulled the book out. It was The Art of Pitching by Tom Seaver. I bought that book. Sean, I read that book from front to cover in one night. And all of a sudden, it was how to set up a pitcher. Where do you stand on the mound? Guy holds his bat this way. Guy holds his bat that way. Look for signs. What a hitter likes to do. What are the trends? And Sean, Tim Nordbrook was my come to Jesus baseball moment where I thought I was working, but I wasn't. And in July of 2004, I fell in love with baseball. And from that point on to this day, I can't get enough of it. Wow, wow man. Wow, what a story. And you're right. It, 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 there is somebody at some part of your career that, like, it's that, you know, come to Jesus moment. You know, the Tim Norbrooks and all those guys. Sack, for you, after that happens and you start getting rolling, you fall in love with baseball, you're holding it like a, like a baby. You get called up in, in, in 86. Can you talk about that call? Where were you? Did you break camp? Or, you know, tell us about the getting called up to the big leagues. I, I did, Sean. And, you know, and this is, <laughs> we're dating ourselves here. But when you get to spring training, your first couple of camps, you get meal money on Monday. You know, if you got meal money on Monday, you were good for another <laughs> week, right? Because they're right. not going to give you $400 and come back Wednesday. <laughs> especially, with, especially with you. That 400 <laughs> Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? The local establishment, that's that money. What for one night? <laughs> so I, I go to my first camp, and I'm, I, I was number 37. And I'm there with Mauro, Yon, Cooper, uh, Raleigh Fingers. And I make it the first, first week, I get meal money. Next week, I get meal money. Guys are starting to get sent down. All of a sudden, 
I'm pitching in games, four innings in relief. I'm a starter, and I'm pitching well. Ed Simmons is catching me every game. And all of a sudden, we get to two weeks left in camp, get back on a Monday. They give me another week's worth of meal money. I'm the only guy left of the minor league guys that's still there. And the last week of spring training, I get another week's worth. So I'm like, damn, I got a shot. Worst case scenario, Chinch. I dodged minor league kids. I'm not eating <laughs> right. soup. And an orange. Like, or cel- celery oh. with peanut butter. <laughs> oh, yeah. you, you come in from minor leagues, you're out there for nine hours. There's four oranges. By the time you get there, all of them are pressed and they're no good. <laughs> bread. There's a butt into the bread. And then, then there's a knife in the peanut butter. And you got jelly in it. You're like, damn, I'd rather eat dirt than eat this. Right? So I find out two days left on a Friday. They call me into the office. And Harry Dalton, Bud Selig was the owner then of the Brewers. <laughs> Bud Selig's standing in the back and he's rocking back and forth. Harry Dalton's sitting there. He said, uh, I don't know how your math skills, but you know we have 26 guys in camp right now. We can only break with 25. And I said, yeah. He goes, well, I want you to know we made a trade. You're not part of the trade, but we traded Moose Haas to the Oakland A's Oof. for two minor leaguers. So 26 <laughs> minus one is 25. <laughs> Congratulations, you made the team. Wow. And I'm wow. telling you, like 24 hours later, I'm on a charter plane <laughs> with Robin Yount, Cecil Cooper, Ben Ogilvy, Ted Simmons going to Chicago for opening day. And I grew up a White Sox fan. I mean, I was on that plane. I didn't know a guy. It was the longest, but yet the coolest flight ever wow. in my life. Like, I, I mean, <clears throat> I was sitting there and I'm like sitting on the plane. I don't know anybody. And I like turn around, you know, this was, I never been on a chartered flight in my life. So what do you, would you like? Do you like steak? You want to bake potato with that? And I'm like, wow. And then you turn around and you see Robin Mount and Paul Motter on the same plane. And it was like intimidating, but yet it was so cool. Danny, two quick follows to that. One, first of all, we know how much you love your mother and what she means to you. What can you, what were the tears like that phone? Oh. What was that phone call like? And then the well, follow up to that real quick is, the first batter you faced where you went, I- I'm living in a dream world. This isn't, this is crazy. Answer one. I remember this was pre cell phone days. I remember going back to the Dobson ranch Inn. that's the hotel I stayed at in Mesa. And I called my mom and she was at work. And I said, you're not going to believe this. I made the team. We opened the season Monday in Chicago and she cried. And I mean, it was just like, Oh man, like, it was, it was the greatest, greatest thing in the world. When I knew I arrived, started the season when I was with Milwaukee, we played the White Sox. Monday, day off Tuesday, play Wednesday, Thursday, <clears throat> go to New York on Friday. I get up, opening day, don't pitch. I'm in the bullpen now. I get up on Thursday, warm up, don't pitch. We fly to New York on Friday. All I remember is coming in on the team bus, on the Digging Expressway, and seeing that white Coliseum stadium. And all it said was, tonight, Milwaukee, 705. And I thought, Yankee Stadium. Holy, are you? Oh, my God. I'm so nervous. I go in there, I get get dressed. I don't, I want to go on the field, but I don't want to be that. First of all, I don't know how to get to the field. (laughs) Like, you know, you got to walk out and you go left, you go right. How do you get to the tunnel? So I get dressed and I'm like, all right, just don't, I don't want to ask another guy to team. Hey, how do you get to the field? So I walk out there and there's a, a usher there. And I'm like, Hey, how do I get to the field? He goes, it must be your first day. I said, yeah. He goes, go right here. Take it right down this ramp. I walk down this ramp. And as I'm walking down the ramp, this cold, drizzly, rainy April night, like 40 degree night. And it's just, it's miserable, but we're going to play. I walk down the ramp. And as I'm walking out, I can hear the base of that, the music at old Yankee oh, yeah. it would be like, boom, boom, boom. And so I walk out, the lights are on. Cause it was dark. It was a, was it was a very overcast day. So the lights were on. I walk into the dugout and all I see is the black backdrop. And I'm thinking, damn, that's where Reggie hit those homers in the world series. That's where he hit the last one off of bird hooting. I'm like, damn. And then I looked up and I saw the third deck in right field. And I'm like, Holy crap. I remember a couple last year watching Fred McGriff hit one up in that third deck. 
And as I walk, I step onto the field, <clears throat> the Yankees are hitting. Who's in there? 23, Don Mattingly. Ah. He's, hitting, he's hitting in the cage. And, and it was like, I was like, Sean, I had to get a hold of myself because I wanted to go like right up to the cage and go like, hey, can I walk? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And all I remember is he hit three in a row. He hit two in the lower deck and he hit the third one, the last swing in that set of swings. He hit it in the upper deck. And I remember seeing the mustache, number 23, and I'm like, damn, I am here, man. It is on. Because to me at that time, Don Mattingly was everything. Like, he was the man. That's when I first was like, man, this isn't fun it, games. This so is cool. legit. So in the Indi- Indiana boy, too, right, Danny? Evans- Evansville, Indiana. <clears throat> and I, I got in a game that night, my first game. Rick Cerrone was catching me. The phone rang. And this was a time when they had the cars in the bullpen, right? And so Bob McClure, Bob McClure says to me, don't you dare get in that car. I'm like, I'm not going to get in the car. All I remember is this. The visitor's bullpen at Yankee Stadium was way out in left center field, right in front of the monuments. That door opened. I'm taking my warm-ups to Larry Haney. And I am like, boom, boom. I'm like... I was throwing five pitches for every second. It was like, hey, I am and he goes, you ready? I go, yeah, I'm ready. He goes, go slow down. I'm like, what the hell with that? I was rapid fire, man. I was so nervous. All I remember, I walked down the steps. And when I walked down the steps, you're so far out there in left center field. All I remember, I could see the manager, George Bamberger. He looked this big <laughs> on the mound with Rick Cerrone. And I'm running out there on the wet grass and they're playing music. And I'm like, holy hell. Oh, <laughs> oh you know, it's like Bellucci. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> you know, like, it's on. And I remember I got to the mound and all Rick Cerrone had his mask up above his head. He said, hey, kid, for, you know, first time after two, hit my glove. Just let me do the thinking. And Sean, he looked, he was 60 feet, six inches away. When I took my eight warm up, he looked like I was thrown to a Lego block. Oh. I was so nervous and he looked so small. And all I could think of was, don't bounce, don't bounce him, don't bounce him. Oh. First guy I faced was Mike Pagliarulo. Wow. I, I struck him out, got out of the seventh inning, struck him out, sat on the bench, and was hoping like hell that was going to be it. Like they said, hey, it's okay. <laughs> They're like, okay, hey, kid, you got you got the next city. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like hyperventilating. And I, I faced Don Mattingly, Dave Winfield, and Ken Griffin. <clears throat> oh, my got God. Got them out, and I remember the best part of this. That night, Pete Vukovic and Danny Dar would say, we're going out because you're not pitching tomorrow. And I go out. We take me out to this bar. Sean, I got up in the morning, set the alarm for 9 o'clock. The bus was at 10. <laughs> I'm laying in the Grand Hyatt, like, wow. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm like, I'm bad shape. I look at the clock, and it says 10-10. <gasps> oh, my God. I don't know what to do. I run downstairs in the lobby, and I'm like, what do I do? I got to get a cab. What do I do? So I, I got a cab to take me to Yankee. I need to go to Yankee Stadium. So this guy starts driving, and I realize he's driving the wrong way because I took the bus the day before, and we took a right and a left out of Yankee Stadium. And I said, hey, Yankee Stadium, where the Yankees play? He goes, oh, okay. <laughs> I get to the ballpark. Sean, I'm not kidding you. It was a, like 1120 dressed on the field. Oh, no. I walk into the ballpark at like 1110. Oh, Everybody, my God. Everybody's dressed but me. <clears throat> and I feel like I'm like that big. I got dressed. So I didn't even take any aspirin. You know, your pregame. <laughs> I was on the field stretching. And like, people were just going, oh, boy. We're a little worried about you, kid. <laughs> we, you got, we've done the end, but you're tougher than you you are. <laughs> Danny, Danny, you have to you have to elaborate on that story a little bit because you know back in those days, you know when, when guys talked about going out and having a few pops. To, when you talk about Pete Vukovic and those guys, that was old school. And I'm sure, I'm sure at this point, you know, you're not really that big of a uh, you know beer drinker. I'm I'm oh. sure that with these guys, it was. Tell us about what was it like <laughs> drinking at the bar with those guys? I walk in the bar with Danny Darwin, <laughs> Pete Vukovic. Oh right? my God, Bob McClure. And they're like, go ahead, take this, kid. So I'm doing, I'm drinking a beer. 
one of the five bar in the city, literally about four blocks from the Hyatt. And all of a sudden, they're like, you know, I, I really hadn't done much shot, shot right. in my life. Like, and it's just, hey, you don't have money. You're like, you know, you go to a free football game party or whatever. All of a sudden, I'm like, yeah. And they're like, just <laughs> shove it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm drinking beer, doing shots. And I'm, I, I, to this day, I'm like, that day I got up so in such bad shape when I got to the ballpark. <laughs> and I, all I remember was, the trainer, John Adams, he comes by me. I just go, he goes, he goes, damn, you smell like a damn 12 pack. I said, I feel like a king right now. Oh, Danny, did you get in that day? Did you get did in? Not. Uh-huh. That, was, that was the reason they took me out because. Uh, it was understood because I was a starter going into the bullpen uh, that if I pitched, uh, I didn't pitch back to back days. So I knew I was. Uh, a- wow. Oh my God, dude. That's so great. That is so great. <laughs> what was it like on that team playing with, with Robin Yount and Paul Molitor? What was it like playing with those guys? It, it, it was at the time you knew you were playing with greats. That's the best way. Two of the greatest players that I ever played with and two different personalities. Robin Yount was really quiet and reserved. Steady Eddie, like showed up to spring training, first 10, 15 games of spring training, 0 for 3, 1 for 4, he'd be hitting 175. Then all of a sudden it would be like, first at bat, boom, with a week to go, miss on the right field, and everybody on the bench would be like, ah, he's ready. He's ready. (laughs) Mowder was a different animal. Paul Mowder was the kind of guy like, Sean, there are some guys that look good when they strike out. Like, I never saw him, I played with him for seven years. I could count on one hand how many times he was really fooled by a pitch where he was out front lunging or got buckled on a 2-2 curveball that, like, buckled him. He was the smartest player I ever played with. My second year in the big leagues, we're in New York, and we're going over a hitters hitters meeting, right? We're going over the Yankees. Then at the end, the hitters and the pitchers would get together and would say, hey, anybody got anything you want to do defensively? What do you guys want to do? What them to do? Ah, uh, nothing. Mowder gets up and says, hey, for you guys, ball hit down the right field line. Winfield's really good going to get a ball to his glove side. He likes to get it, spin and throw. But if he has to go across his body, if the ball's hitting right center, run on him all day long because he's not as accurate. He likes to get it, spin, regroup and throw. I'm warming up in the eighth inning of a game with the man on first. Mowder hits a ball to right center field, and it's like a line drive over second base. He's not stopping. He's going to third because it was a ball that Winfield had to get on his glove side. And and I'm like, I'm warming up, but I'm like, holy (laughs) shit, this is going to happen. He's doing it. This was the ball hit to Winfield's right (laughs) that he had to go get and not spin. There was no – he didn't think about stopping at second. It was a bullet. So cool. And, it, and he came, and Winfield came up throwing, and he was like five feet wide of the target at third. Mauer got in safe, sacrificed by. I pitched the ninth inning, and I was like, that stuff, you, you have to have a, just a crazy forward thinking mind. Yeah. Wow. How brilliant he was. Wow. And that must have been cool for you, too, being so young and, and, and seeing those guys, how they went about their business, how they prepared for games, you know, for you moving forward. It must have been, you know, just, you know, the, the part I never, I mean, Robin Young, there are just so many things. My rookie year, we were the swing team. Like, what the hell is that? Right. The swing <laughs> team, when you were in the AL East, one team, because it was uneven numbered, finished the year on the West Coast. So you played West Coast games. So we're going to play in Oakland. So we have a day game in Toronto on a Wednesday, day off Thursday, Friday, we're in Oakland. Game's over Wednesday. I walk in the training room and Yount's laying on the training table. And I saw this needle about this long. He had really bad turf toe. I never had turf toe. I didn't know what it was. But I, when I walked in the training room and I saw that doctor, I, about, I was like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> we get to Oakland Friday and he's in the lineup. I don't know what, now, I'm still at the point where like, I don't really know him that well. And I said, his name was the kid. That was his nickname. And I said, hey, kid. I go, man, I got to ask you something. That shot hurt. He goes, what do you think? I go, hell yeah. I go, you're playing today? He goes, yeah. He goes, hey, did you ever, when you were a kid, your mom and dad, you think like you had a stomach ache, your mom and dad went to work, and then you got to stay home, and you watched TV, and you thought, hey, you pulled one over? I go, yeah, we all did that. He goes, that's how it is in baseball. 
you find out how easy it is to take a day off to start doing it over and over again. Mm. Don't take any days off. I was like, wow. Lesson learned. (laughs) That's what I tried to do the next 18 years, Sean. If I felt like I was breathing, I could pitch. Never on a DL. Never on a DL once in your career after that. Not one time, I know. And I'm I'm proud of that. Mm. You know, people ask, like, I, I think in today's game, I think one of your best abilities has to be availability. Are you available? Can a manager, can a coach, can your boss, can they count on you and depend on you? That's, that is so important. Danny, looking at that nowadays too, with the relievers that play the game, listen, for anyone that doesn't know what Dan Plesak's arsenal like was like when he first came up, you're like a lot of the guys nowadays. You were, you were probably touching 100 miles an hour, nasty slider, just closing games out. So, you know, for the, the mentality for, for um, nowadays with that kind of stuff, can you talk about pitching with that kind of arsenal? And if you don't have it a certain day, like, you know, what was that like mentally? Sean, I felt like this from 1986 through 1989. My fastball was upper 90s, 80, 87, 88 all-star game. I struck out Daryl Strawberry on three fastballs, 98, 98, 99. Wow. I felt like when I warmed up for about a four-year period, if I had my slider and I had good enough command of it, I was going to be really hard to beat because I could throw that thing down and into righties I actually had an easier time against righties than lefties because I didn't face a lot of lefties. And so it, it's just it's just a visual. So the lefties that I did face, they were Tony Gwynn, they were Don Mattingly, they were Will Clark, they were George Brett. They were the good ones. And so you had to be careful. But I what I what I I I felt like if I had them both, and the funny part is, and I don't know if you went through this as a hitter, when you're young. And you come up on a Friday night and within like five throws, it's just boom, boom, boom. You're like, I'm good for the next month. Like I'm assuming as a position player, when you're in the box and the bat feels light and you almost got to tell yourself, all right, slow down. It's just like, bam, you can't do anything but hit a barrel. It's Uh bam, but the pitch is up, down, away. You're just boom, boom. You're, You're just, your reactions are there. Later on in your career, you feel really good that day. And you're like, I better calm this down because I only have so many in the barrel. So I don't want to hit for 25 minutes because I know tomorrow that bat's going to start feeling heavy. I'm not going to be the same. That was the biggest adjustment for me at the end. My mind knew what I wanted to do, but my body wouldn't allow me to do what I wanted to do. And so I had to be Pete Vukovic. I was with Milwaukee working out in the winter. He came up to me one day. He's watching me throw in this indoor gym. And he goes, Hey, I got a question for you. Have you ever thrown a two, two fastball up and away intentionally to a lefty to throw a three, two breaking ball. You'll lock them up. I'm, I said, never in my life would I ever want to intentionally run a count to full Sean. I made a living for the last three years two two run a fastball up and away for a three, two curveball, a three, two slider for a strike. And I made, wow. it, but you have to, you have to go through that. You know, you have to, you have to realize, like, I have to make changes in my game if I want to continue to play. Yeah. Wow, Danny. Well, you know, I, I, I faced you towards the end of your career when you're with the Diamondbacks and the Phillies. But I remember, I remember the one time we faced our, and I think it was 2003. It was your last year. You came in with the base. I think it was the bases loaded. You came in to face me, and you know you were wheeling and dealing, and I hit a, I hit a four bullet. six three to end the inning. A bullet, but yeah, it was right at the second baseman. I remember it. Boom. I'm gonna- I'm going to tell you how I remember it. I remember it well. You were the final nail in my retirement coffin. I'm going to tell you what happened. We were fighting down the stretch to catch the Marlins for the wild card, who eventually won the whole thing in 2003. Came in to face you, and I fell behind ball one, ball two. And I remember thinking, you know what? I know this guy's a great hitter. I can't dance anymore. I'm going to turn a 2-0 fastball. I want to see how far he can hit it. I'm going to get it over quick. I threw a four C fastball down and away. You took it for a strike. And I'm telling you, I threw this thing and I felt like I was having flashbacks from <laughs> Milwaukee. I'm like, you're damn right, Casey. I got something for you, right? And as I get the ball back, I'm walking out of the mound. You know, you can see on the screen, like type of pitch, fastball, 88. I was like, 88. Holy 
<laughs> downhill with the wind at my back. I just threw the best heater I have. <laughs> Holy crap. The next pitch, I'm like, I can't throw that again. I throw Sean Casey the worst hanging slider <laughs> a Matt Mixer you could throw, and he hits an absolute P-rod. I need missile to chase Utley that thank God if he didn't have if he would if it wouldn't have got glove on him it would have shattered his private right <laughs> this ball was hit so hard boom flip the second second to short four six three double play I'm walking off the mound and you know Larry Bow is like way to get the ground ball to give in like, I'm like are you kidding me the guy just split the ball in half <laughs> You guys are crazy. Sean Sean told the exact same story from yeah. his perspective right before we came on. The memories yeah. you guys have. I, well, I just remember being so pissed because I'm like, you know, <laughs> I, I hit it. I hit it and it like comes off the bat. You're like, oh, that's a good one. But at, at the end of the day, when you're a hitter, there's there's eight guys out there, not, you know, nine guys. I hit it right to second base. And I remember you walking off and I'm like, you know, police act did it again, man. Got out of it, did his job, figured it out, you know. That that right there, because I was still tinkering on. Uh, my ERA was like in the mid twos. And I'm like, I'm starting to feel good. I'm like, I feel like I'm getting a second win in September, right? And I remember when I threw that pitch, I was like, if I ever threw 193 again, that was it. I look up type of pitch, FB, 88. I'm like, 88. Oh, my God. That's so great, Sam. By the way, eight at bats, eight at bats versus each other career. One for seven with. One walk, two strikeouts. Yeah. See, so he owned me. Danny <laughs> owned me. Danny right. owned me. Nobody owned you. That's yeah. Nobody owned Sean Casey. <laughs> Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. that. That is not true. That is not true. D- Danny, you went to three All-Star games, brother. We're one of the best lefties in the game. We always like here to talk about uh, maybe a good All-Star story you had. What, what do you remember from those All-Star games? And there's so, Is there some moment that sticks out for you? I know you talked about 88 with Strawberry, but... Any other moments that might stick out with you? Yeah, my first one, 1987 uh, in <sighs> Oakland. Pitching with the Brewers. We end the season. We end the first half in Oakland. So the game's there in Oakland. <clears throat> and there were a lot of comparables between me and Dave Rigetti. So for whatever reason why, Dave Rigetti was always my guy. So, you know, when you get called up my first year, I make the team. And I remember George Bamberger, after I pitched in New York, a couple of weeks later, he called me in the office. He said, hey, kid, I know you want to be a starter. But we're going to leave you in the bullpen. You're going to be Milwaukee's version of Dave Rigetti. And I'm like, wow. okay, guys, we're going to leave you in the bullpen. So my first all-star game, I'm like, dang, like I'm nervous as hell. So I, I walk in and I walk into the locker room. You know, you're looking for your locker. Where am I going to, where am I going to be? Right. Steve Vucinich, the clubhouse guy in Oakland. So I walk in and Steve goes, Hey, you're over there. I'm like, okay. I walk over there and I see Dan Plezak, Dave Rigetti, <laughs> Nolan Ryan, <laughs> Clement, Mike Saberhagen. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> and at this point, I didn't even look at Nolan Ryan, <laughs> Saberhagen, Clemens, Gubas up. I saw Dave Rigetti. To me, and my locker was next to Dave Rigetti. I remember getting dressed. I was there early. And I, you played at these where you have to sign so many balls. Like it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Time. I get done doing that and I'm sitting in my locker. And all of a sudden, I'm like, here he is walking in. Like, he doesn't know, like, I, I don't know what you call it nowadays, like a man crush or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was your guy, right? I mean, and he walked in, and I'm like, okay, that's Rigetti. What do I do? Do I stand <laughs> up? Do I shake his hand? What do I do? And I'm like, hey, Dave, damn, please. He goes, I know who you are. And I'm like, <clears throat> Sean, he stood next to me for the entire batting practice, and we talked about pitching, about – and somebody, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Kirby Puckett said, hey – he, Kirby Puckett used to call me hernia. And I'd be like, and I finally I asked him, why you call why are you call me hernia? He goes, because if I had to throw that hard, I'd have to go in for hernia surgery. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So he called me hernia. So he was like, hey hernia, man, you keep throwing me that first pitch slider. I'm gonna look for it next time. And I'm like, well, I don't know. And Rugetti grabbed me. And he stopped me from talking. He goes, Don't ever tell them anything about what you do ever that's yours wow. you, you're not here to be friends with him we're friends with him but we don't talk pitch you don't ever talk about how you're going to get 
him out ever. Mm. Let him wow. figure it out on his own. I'm like, mm. okay, understood. <laughs> I'm like, yes, sir, Dave. <laughs> duty. <laughs> By the way, that was one of the, that lineup, that 87 team you had. Think of, uh, you're talking about walking into that locker room case. I'm just going to rip through your lineup. Ricky Henderson, Don Mattingly, Wade Boggs, George Bell, Dave Winfield, Cal Ripken Jr., Terry Kennedy, Willie Randolph, and starter was Brett Saberhagen. That was maybe like one of – that was oh. like the, the shining time of the 80s, and you're sitting in that locker room with all those guys. That's crazy. You know what made it cool then too, Rich? <laughs> we did have baseball on every night on every different channel. So, like, when the All-Star game was on, it was like – Man, everybody watched the All-Star game. And it's like the game of the week on Saturday. If you were the game of the week and you played on Saturday, it was like everybody watched because there weren't 20 games on on 20 different channels. So, yeah, it was it a was big deal. It was big. Dude, Danny, who was the toughest guy you ever you ever faced? I mean, we're, we're, there's so many great players that you, you went up against, but who was the toughest guy for you, for you that you ever faced? And who was one of the guys you feel like, you know what, I, I'm so glad he's up there because I'm going to dominate him? Tony Gwynn was by far the, far the hardest for me. I, really? I, yeah, yeah. Sean, I want to say like 8 for 11, he hit a bomb off me. I couldn't mm. ever get him to swing and miss. Like, he was just – he was – he had a two strike approach throughout unless it was one Oh two one, he would hunt the pitch and it always seemed like he was, he was right on me. I just, eight, I eight just, for 11. Couldn't, just couldn't, couldn't get him out. And whether it was a one run game, a two run game, <laughs> blowout game, getting an innings worth, it was just like, ah, here we go again. I, I just hoped that he wasn't like the first out of an inning where I knew I was going to start an inning with a guy on first base, right? A, a guy like it, it's just crazy how, baseball is but like a guy like cal ripkin jr who, who you would think would have a lot of success off of me it always seemed like whatever i was throwing he was overthinking it it, it mm. and it would be like i could start him two at bats first pitch slider and he'd take him for a strike so it was almost like the third time i faced him he was looking for a slider and i threw a first pitch fastball middle third in and he took it for a strike and you could see the frustration in I just let a I just let a first pitch fastball go right down the middle and I let it go. He just could never figure me out. Two for and eighteen. Like, Two for eighteen with five K's, Case. Wow. Yeah, he just could never figure it wasn't that I was that good, Sean. He could just never figure me out. What about Reggie Jackson, Mr. October? We, we looked up the numbers. You were he was 0 for six against you with six punch outs. How did you pitch to him? Like what what what, what, what when you face Reggie, what'd you throw him? Yeah, I, well, I almost got fired because of Reggie last year from MLB Network. <laughs> Dropping a couple F bombs on the air. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. Mr. October almost turned me. <laughs> I forgot about that. First time I faced Reggie. I was with Milwaukee and he was with the angels. And I will say this. I had somebody ask me this the other day. Can you name me five guys that when they walked into the plate, like it was a surreal moment. Reggie was number one because of Mr. October and what he had done. Reggie was Reggie. There was just, there was a mystique about him. He was hated in Milwaukee. He was hated everywhere. He went on the road he was booed. He was villain number one, but he was what he was. And I just, I, I just got the biggest kick out of facing him. Reggie Jackson would be number one on my list. Number two was George Brett. I, I, Sean, I can't tell you what it was like to be standing in a box in ah. George Brett. It was the amazing thing. I'm going to throw Don Manningly in there because at that time in my career in the early to mid eighties, Don Manningly was everything. Cal Ripken was the fourth guy that just, I just couldn't, I couldn't stare at him enough. Like when you're a pitcher, a, a reliever, and he struck out to make the last out, and you're sitting in the bullpen. You want to see like, is he going to, the guy that runs his glove out to him, is he going to, you know, treat him like, you know, you know what I mean? Like kicking him. And he just, he would get his glove, run out to the field. He was the same guy. And, and I think the fifth guy, just because he was just an imposing figure was Dave Winfield. Dave Winfield was like, Dave Winfield was Conseco McGuire before Conseco and McGuire. He was just big, strong, imposing. 
but those five guys jump out to me. Like when you ask me, like, Hey, what, what, what do you, what, what do you remember about five guys? But Reggie was numero uno. Wow. wow. Also George wow. Brett, George Brett four for 24 against you, Danny with four K's. She didn't do very much. Wow. Mattingly eight for 16 with he took me deep. one walk homer, off. five rubies. Yeah. Yeah. Walk off homer against me in Yankee stadium, about two rows out two one hanging slider <laughs> and a rock at the right field, a game winner. I remember. Wow. Danny, Danny, is he a hall of famer? Mattingly? I want to say so, Sean, but I just don't know if the body of the, for four or five years, you could say he was the best player in the game, but was it eight, nine, ten years? I hate having this discussion because then it makes it seem like I'm downgrading a player. Mm. I just don't know. The Hall of Fame has to be reserved for, like, the cream of the crop over an extended period of time. He's one of my favorite players, but I think he's just short of being a Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah. Man, was he good, though, oh. for those years. So good. Danny, you played with so many good managers throughout your throughout your career, but you played for one guy that was my favorite manager ever in Detroit and just one of the greatest guys, Jimmy Leland. You got any good oh. Jim, Le- Jim oh. Leland stories for us? <laughs> Why ever? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. 1995, I'm with the Pirates. We have a meeting before a game. We're playing the Phillies. We're going over with the Phillies lineup. Darren Dalton comes up. Ray Miller, the pitching coach. We're, so we have this meeting like, hey, Darren Dalton, slider speed bat. Our scouts are telling us the last two weeks you can't catch up to a good heater. Just throw him just fastball. Okay. So I come into a game. Mickey Moore and Dini's on second in the eighth inning. We're up by a run. I run into the bullpen. Leland hands the ball. Hey, you know what we got to do with this? Like, yeah. I said, All right. Skip. All right you know what do? All right, let's go. You know, all right. So Mark Perrin's catch, right? First pitch, fastball. Boom, strike one. Foul ball. Ball one. Ball two. Foul ball. It's like eight straight heaters, and he's on on every one of them. I'm like, you know what, Leland? I'm like, ah, I'm throwing this slider. Don't slide. So Mark Parents, he's not even put. he's putting like the signs down so fast that I can't read him because we know it's a fastball. So he's going like, four, three, two, five, five, four, three. And I'm like, and I stand there, and he looks at me like, and he, he did this. He went like, <laughs> Throw a slider, Sean, and he wraps one. Darren Dalton hits one between second base and shortstop. Base hit, game tied. I'm like, oh, I'm running it back up home. <laughs> Orandini's round in third, and I'm like, ah. Uh. <laughs> I don't even get to the mound. Lena comes storming out to the mound. Doesn't say a word. You know, he's not the tallest guy in the world, but he would want to get on top of the mound. If he stayed below, he'd be looking up at you like this. <laughs> So he doesn't say a word to me. He sticks his arm out. I put the ball in. I walk in. I get to the dugout, and Ray Miller's sitting on the bag, of the bucket of sunflower seeds with a heater going. He's going, <laughs> I get there. Mundo goes, hey, uh, was that what I thought it was? I go, yeah. He goes, ooh. <laughs> go on upstairs. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Game gets tied. We end up winning in extra innings, about 12 innings. Tommy Sant, after the game is over, Comes over to me and he goes, hey, he wants you in the office and he's hot. So I'm thinking you're goofing around, right? So I walk in there and he's got his spread after the game. He's sitting there. He's got a heater going. He's sitting there. His hat's crooked off the side. He's like, oh, hey, uh, I, you know, I want you to meet me in the lobby at 9. 9 o'clock in the lobby tomorrow. Meet me there at 9 and don't be late. I'm like, okay, for what? For what? Because I got to find out what the hell is wrong with you. I want to get you tested. And I said, for what? He goes, you're deaf or dumb or one or the other. I want to find out which one it is because you sure as hell can't follow instructions. <laughs> Whoa. And I mean, it's hot. So I walk out of there and I'm like beat red. Like, and now all the folks know he's really pissed. So the next day, Sunday day game, I'm standing there doing the national anthem at the vet. And I'm in the aisle way there. And Leland's standing next to me. And, and I, I walk out of the bullpen. He goes, hey, uh, hey, where? here. He goes, hey, I got to know, like, what do you got left? He was great as far as, like, if you had bonuses. Like, if you need to get in two more games for 20 grand, he'd want to know. So, hey, he, if he was – he, you know, if you played hard, he'd put you in there to get a game so you're getting closer to getting some money. And I said, I, I need a, I need two more for 50. He goes, yeah, hey, you keep doing that, that shit. You know what? You don't get <laughs> one game the rest of the year. And I, you think I'm fooling? Uh, just test me. What? That's what it would be. Now get the hell out of here. I walk out to the bullpen and I'm like, holy shit, he's hot still. So 
Phone rings. They bring me in to get Darren Dalton. I run in from the bullpen. He's standing there with the mound. Sean, this is what he said. Uh, do it your way, but it better work. <laughs> and he ran off the mound. I'm like, oh. okay. Sean, I got him to one ball and two strikes. Struck him out with a slider. Oh, oh my God. God. And all he said to me was, boy, you sure as hell like to test my patience. <laughs> he goes, boy, you got some big balls. Because I sure as hell wouldn't have done that. <laughs> That's so awesome. Oh, my God. That is so great. One of a kind. Oh, He's best. such, so one of a kind. It's so great. Oh, my God. We, we played for a lot of guys. Yeah. And to me, this is the separator. <laughs> when, when Jim Leland comes out, of batting practice. He comes out for the day and the phone goes in his back pocket and you could see him smiling. You were going to have the greatest day ever. One of the things he did that I'll never forget, and I don't know if he did this with the Tigers, he would walk around in the outfield and talk to every yes. maybe for only two seconds, but he would, he'd have his fungo in his back pocket. He would start at the right field line and he would pick off guys one by one by one. And it may be he would come up to me and go like, hey, you know, I, I want to... <laughs> I want, I want to get you a game. And, oh, I, you know, can you get somebody out? And you're like, hey, I like, bring you in. It's like, you know, it's like a goddamn hit parade. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, you got to help me. Hell, hell I want, I want, I know, I'd like to put you in, but God damn, you're like a, you're like a fire. You're like gasoline. He goes, you're like throwing gasoline on a fire. He goes. <laughs> You know, I, I keep bringing you the games. All, all the homes around the ballpark are catching on fire. <laughs> oh, my oh, my oh my god! I remember, I remember one time Chad Durbin's going out to <laughs> going out to pitch. Danny, you'll love this story. And I'm get, I'm just was lucky enough to be there. I'm in the dugout, and uh, you know, it's right before the game. Durbin's getting ready to go out there starting pitch. He's like, Durb, Durb, hey, real quick, real quick. It's like. He's like, hey, listen, last game you walked the house, it was a three-pack night for me. Almost killed me. He's like, he's like, he's like my, my lungs almost shut down. He's like, can you, can you throw some strikes tonight, make it a two-pack night, and everyone will be happy. He's <laughs> 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 oh my god! It's so good. Hey, he knew he knew I loved horses, so he came up to me and go, "Hey, I gotta tell you what I did. I bet a I bet a horse today at eight to one." I said, "How would he do?" I had a goddamn horse ran at twelve thirty. <laughs> Jim Leland so much. His stories are so good, bro. They're so believable. He came back one time and said to me, Danny, he's like, I was told I was sucking. I was hitting like a buck forty. He comes back and he's like, No, no, it was on our way to the World Series, but I was I was struggling for a couple weeks. He goes, Hey, we're on the plane. He comes back with a heater on the plane. It's like 2006. I'm like, Hey, Skip, <laughs> do you know they outlawed cigarettes like 25 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> supposed to smoke on the flight. So he comes back. He goes. He goes. He goes. Goddamn case. He goes. What are you using? What are you using? I go. What do you mean? What am I using? He goes. To rob the bank. To rob the bank. <laughs> <laughs> he goes. He goes. You going to double barrel? Double barrel Uzis. Another <laughs> <laughs> hey, great thing he always do. If you ever called me, you're going to have a blood question. He always made sure the next day's pitcher was like his best pitcher. So he had a big meeting. Oh. John Lieber had a, we were struggling. I was with the Pirates. And he was, John Lieber was kind of a heavy set guy. Oh. And we, so we have a meeting before the game. Yo, what are you guys going to step up? Yo, we're just doing two thirds. This bull crap's got to stop. So what are you guys got to step up? So John Lieber, like inning and third, he's getting waffled. He comes out of the game. He starts. 
John Lieber was just up in the big leagues. And he was already, he was eating spread. And so Leland came up like in the third inning to get another pack of cigarettes. He sees, he sees Lieber. He's already eating ribs and corn. So after the game's over, get everybody out of here. Leland throws all the food on the and he goes, Hey, oh, Lieber, God damn it. Every time I see you, you got a popsicle in one hand and a hamburger in the other. Goddamn Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I've heard this. How hard was it not to laugh when he was doing that? Didn't you oh. guys all have to bite your tongues? Oh, the thing is you had to do, you had to <sighs> down, look down at your shoes. Because if you looked up and you knew when he left and he was on a rampage, you're like, ah, oh, that's not <laughs> He's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you one more goddamn thing. You're like, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Dude, Danny. And I'll send I gotta... all you guys. I'll send every one of you guys down to AAA. And if you don't believe me, you just test it. Because I run this show. And, off. and then Tommy Chan would be like, nah, he's got one more. <laughs> he's coming back. He's coming back. <laughs> you guys are imposters. This is like Halloween. You guys are just a bunch of big league team. Oh, my God. <laughs> Ryan Dempster told us a story that he said once. What was the case? The one no, he said, he said go, he, I'm sure Dan here too. If you, if you guys go out tonight, be careful. You might get arrested for impersonating <laughs> baseball players. <laughs> Danny, Danny, I got one more Leland story because this is just so good. Uh, so when he told me one time he was with the Pirates and there was this one wife of one of the, one of the pitchers that <clears throat> was just, you know, he would take the pitcher out a little early and the wife would be like, you got to be kidding me. Tell Leland I'm going to rip. What's he doing? That guy doesn't know what he's doing down there. He's a total moron. And it, it, it kind of got back to Skip like, okay, this 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 wife is riding you so bad and, and blah, blah, blah. So this one day he goes out, takes the pitcher out. It's like four and two thirds. He comes down the tunnel. The wife's waiting for the, for his, her husband in the tunnel. She's like, like, what's that asshole doing? He doesn't know what he's doing. He's a total idiot. Blah blah blah. Well, it was getaway day, right? So they get on the <laughs> they get on the team bus after the game, right? And so you know the the wives are in the front, and the, you know they're sitting with their with their husbands or whatever. You know, back when the wives used to travel on the bus, and Leland said he's the last one on the bus because he's you know obviously the manager. So he's getting on the bus and he's passing this the the, the um, wife of the one player, and she's like, she's like. If I was married, she finally got him. She's like, if I was married to you, I would give you poison. And then, then Leela goes, if I was married to you, I'd take it. <laughs> God, just so, so, so quick, bro. So quick. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, so good. Oh my god, Danny. So I wanna before we, <laughs> we I wanna stay on Leland just one more thing. Like you talked about Leland and the horses, because I still talk to I still talk to Jim and Skip up like, how's how's police sack doing? How's he doing with the horses? You got any horses? You know, I'm like, that's why a couple of times I've asked you, Sack, are you still got the horses going? Because Leland wants to know about the horses. But that was one of your things, bro. When you were done retired, you, I think you were even like Dave Pallone and Harness. Yeah. You were like Harness, <laughs> you know, racing. You know, can you what? talk about that? Your love for horses and and you were, you almost made a profession out of that when you were done playing. I did. A year after <clears> I, retired, I bought my grandfather's farm in like the mid '90s. And we always had harness horses, standard breads, that race at the meadows, that race at Yonkers, the Meadowlands. And I owned them forever. And I just decided when I was done, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to train horses. So literally until I took the job at MLB Network from 2003 to 2009, that's basically what I did, Sean. I trained three or four horses. I did some Cubs pre and post game show. And I loved it. But I'll tell you. You're talking about a labor of love in an industry where you're talking long hours getting up at the crack of dawn. And that is a, and it's rain or shine, cold, wind, whatever. But I loved it. And, and Jim and I, you know, he loves the horses. So we had that thing in common. He was, you know, Sean, when I look back, I played with some great men. I played for some great ones. Cito Gaston, Buck Showalter. But I think the greatest, greatest compliment you could give a manager is he was everything wrapped up into one. He could be the nicest guy. He could ride you. He, he was like, he was the, 
I won't, I won't say only, but he was a guy that if he told me I need you to run into that burning apartment right now, that I would like, uh, I would do it. You know what I mean? Like, because feel the same way. He, he had a connection that he, he could, he could reprimand you, but he could put his arm around you the next day. But there was always, I don't know if you felt this, like, I love him as a baseball guy, but there's still a part of Jim Leland that I wouldn't say I'm scared of or I'm afraid of, but that's what made him so good. Like he yeah. brings you in and you can laugh. And even now I played golf with him last winter and you're laughing, but you just, you kind of know that other side of him that he's the boss and yeah. he, conne- he connects with pitchers, catchers, outfielders, everyday players. I, I just know this. He's real. Yeah, what you see is what you get, and he's real. And his story's amazing. Wasn't a very good player. Started out as a coach with the White Sox. Tony Russa gave him his first break, and he's a lifer, man. He's like Larry Boa. They're baseball lifers. They're going to be yep. baseball till they take their last breath. And for me, if if Earl Weaver's in the Hall of Fame and the numbers, whatever, you know, Leland was also managed some some tough teams here in Pittsburgh. For me, Cooperstown needs to come calling for Jim Leland at some point. Yeah. Jim Leland not in Cooperstown for me would be an absolute absolute shame. You know, I, at least that that's how I feel, uh, you know, about about Skip uh, and, and going in one day. Uh, Sack, Roger Clemens. Whew. What was – you played with You played with him in Toronto, right? Was it Toronto? Was back-to-back years, 95-96, won the Cy Young. Uh, he was the most dominating pitcher. I played summer baseball with him in 1982. Really? Hutchinson, Kansas, in the Jayhawk League. We played in the Hutchinson cool. Broncos. Me, him, Calvin Schiraldi were all on the same team. He was, I, I could say this, there's so much swirling around him, controversy on the field, off the fields, PEDs. I could tell you this as a teammate of his for two years. Loved him. He cared. He cared about you. He cared about the third outfielder. He cared, he cared about the guy that didn't get at bats. He genuinely cared, and not just the day that he pitched. I can't say enough good things about him. Loved him as a teammate. Did he get special treatment? Yeah, but he's Roger Clements. When we had PFP on an off day on a Monday, he would fly from Toronto to go see his family in Austin, in Texas. I didn't care because you knew, though, when he came back, he earned, he earned those stripes. Loved them. Uh, I, w- I was lucky to play with some greats. Randy Johnson in Arizona was another great. Yeah. But there was a time where Roger Clemens, to me, was about as good as it gets. You got to put him right in there with Pedro and Schilling <laughs> and John Smoltz. Maddox was a, a different kind of pitcher, you know, more of a pitcher and not a thrower. But Clemens was a stud. He was yeah. a stud. Yeah, wow. Wow. That's I, I, lo- I love hearing that. I love hearing good stuff about Roger Clemens, especially for a guy that played with him and, and was so close with him. All right, we wrap it up here, we, Danny. We, we we do this thing called 9 and 90. Chinch has yes. nine questions. Uh-oh. Although, although yeah. the, Le- the Leland story, the, I, the I, 8 to 1, I still can't count. Yeah, we're not going to do better. <laughs> I still can't. Hey, I bet the horse was 8 to 1. How did you? Yeah. Hey, we're at 12 30. <laughs> But I got to add one more thing because I didn't want to interrupt you guys before. When you're talking about horse racing, I have this lasting image in my head because it's one of my favorite things. When Dan Plesak is one of the funniest human beings on the planet. There's no question about it. He's all serious sometimes to the network. But the funniest thing, my favorite thing working with Dan is my, I used to sit like right and I used to look right into Dan's office. We can look right at each other. And when he was in a good mood, you're in a good mood and you're like, he's like, watching a game and he's like you gotta throw him a backdoor slider here whatever <laughs> and he sits there and he gets something right he has a horse whip in the back <laughs> yeah. and he'll just go yes it is the funniest I've, I've got to replace that I have a new one oh, oh, okay. my office. it's the funniest <laughs> thing alright so we're in for so a treat good. here for 9 and 90 so I'll ask a question Casey answers it just answer the same question right off of him okay here you go Hall of Fame baseball broadcaster Marty Brenneman here. It's time for 9 in 90, the most ridiculous segment in all of sports. First one right now, you order a big-ass steak in a restaurant. For the side, Case, do you go baked potato, mashed potato, or steak fries? I'm probably going to go with uh, the steak fries. Okay. I'm going 
I'm going mashed potatoes. Yes, I'm a mashed potato guy. All right, more intimidating, an angry Larry Boa or an angry Jim Leland did. You know, uh, 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 Bo, I don't know Bo that way because I, I, I know Bo, I know a happy Larry Boa, yeah. but an angry Jim Leland is really, really <laughs> scary. So I'm gonna have to say angry Jim Leland. Yeah, I'm gonna go along with that. I've seen them both, I've played for both. There's something about Leland that you think that, that in the middle of the night in your hotel room, you're gonna wake up and he's gonna have the key to your room. <laughs> he's gonna beat the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's what's worse, Sean? Broken air conditioner in the summer or broken heat in the winter? A broken air conditioner. I could deal with. I, I I'm just really <clears throat> hairy and hot in general, so I I don't I could I could do the uh, broken heater. Yeah, I, that's me. I, the, the AC, uh, no AC. I'm not good at like feeling sticky and comfortable. Like yeah. The, the, you can have take, take the cooling system. I need I need the AC. <laughs> okay, good. All right. This is you guys are both aficionados of this subject. So I ask you, Sean, best ballpark food in the big leagues right now. Oh, and I mean in the clubhouse or or anywhere. Like, you know what I mean? Anywhere. Concessions, clubhouse, you go to a park, what else about? <laughs> I don't know why it pops into my head and Danny might appreciate this, but the bratwurst in Milwaukee, for some reason, they're different than anywhere else in the country. So I could go for a Rosie cooking me a nice brat right now in Milwaukee. <laughs> I'm going to go with Guaranteed Bay Park, home of the Chicago White Sox. Their grand, their ballpark food is to die for. Mm -hmm. I, I dread getting assignment to go there. I go there at 10, I leave at 2.35. I eat all the sausages, which is a disaster. Wait, hey, when you were in Toronto, real quick, did you were you there when they had like the McDonald's catering? Absolutely. Oh my Absolutely. God. Did you just Saturday. crush McDonald's every day? <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, that was that was the spread before and after games. Oh, oh my God. God. You could have as many sausage meat muscles as you want. Uh, <laughs> that is yeah. the, 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 the nutritionists nowadays in the clubhouse would be having a heart attack <laughs> yeah. if they saw a sausage egg McMuffin <laughs> for breakfast. For the exactly, right? <laughs> okay. All right, next one. Better sport to watch, <clears throat> college basketball or NBA basketball? I, I think call, nothing like March Madness for me, so college basketballs. Mm. Hey, man, I, I think there's something that – I know the day and age, there's just something genuine about college. There's something about kids and, and given it, they're all, they're not getting paid a lot of money to do it, but college basketball. Yeah, that, that Duke UNC game the other day oh. was like one of the greatest I, things I've ever watched on TV. Wasn't it? Unbelievable. Okay, next one. Uh, rank these fast foods from worst to best, Sean. McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King. Oh, I'm gonna have to say, uh, McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's because I think Wendy's at least the meat might be real. <laughs> I saw some. I saw something the other day on YouTube. This lady pulled out a McDonald's hamburger from 24 years ago in a Nike box. <laughs> it, the the bun wasn't molded, and neither was the meat. Oh, I was really? like, oh yeah, dude, legit, <laughs> legit. I, I I'm I'm gonna go. Rank. I'm just gonna go by my ranking because I am a, a Whopper aficionado. Me too. A, oh, I'm gonna. So I'm gonna go. McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King. Give me a Whopper. I can't even get through the drive thru start eating it. And I've got like mayonnaise is on my seatbelt that's coming across me. And I'm going like this with my seatbelt. Oh my God. I'm so glad you said that. Tomatoes falling down between my legs. I'm putting down my car mat. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm being at When I was in college, when I was in college at Columbia on 111th Street, Sundays at 8 p.m., 99 cents for two double Whoppers. Oh. Me and my friends oh, used to crush oh. The rats in that part of the neighborhood of the city were like six oh. feet tall. So I'm like, yeah. I'm glad in, co in college, too, I used to dip I used to dip the Whopper into the ranch dressing oh. they had. I'm like, oh, this is delicious. <laughs> All right, two more. This goes into this one. Grossest teammate you've ever shared a locker room with, Sean? Uh, <laughs> Grossest teammate. Well, Pete Harnish was one of the, um, like, just was naked all the time, and his body wasn't the best of bodies, so I have to say that was pretty gross at times. <laughs> what do you got? I, I, I would say my first big league spring training, Mike Caldwell, the former <laughs> NC State guy, like, he would do, like, I don't even I don't even want to sit. I get, yeah, well, listen, why not? He would, like, sit in the dugout and, like, Spit on the dugout roof, and it would like, oh. would like 
drop down. And I would be like, I'd be like, what the hell is this? Like, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty gross. <laughs> All right, last one. And again, uh, Dan has kind of opened up to this, but Dan is about as good a professional eater as humanly possible. He's in great shape, but he enjoys a good meal. So, between the two of you, you mentioned the brats. I got a bratwurst eating contest in Milwaukee between Sean Casey and Dan Plesak. I don't know the answer to this question. Who do you guys think wins? <laughs> I think Plesak pulls it off somehow. He's like, you know what? I, I would make sure that we, we knew the day was coming. I would eat for a couple of days. So I, the last thing I would want to do would be humiliated in Milwaukee at a prize eating contest. So I would make sure I was hungry. I would be like Joey Chestnuts. Just <laughs> Joey Chestnuts. All right. That's you'd, nine and nine. You'd, uh, Danny, you'd have to bring me adult depends, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. What's Sean doing walking over there? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, Danny, this this has been one of the best episodes we've ever had, bro. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, going down memory lane with us and yeah. sharing some of your stories. This has been wonderful, man. And yeah. I'll, I'll see you in, I'll see you next week at work. Yeah. Bingo. Sounds good, Case. I love you, Case buddy. You're the, man, guys. You're the best. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Over You're out. the best. You're the best sack. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Oh my God, Chinch! That was I'm 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 like my my first it, off my I'm cramping in my ribs. I'm yeah. crying. I'm still crying. I know, tears. Dan, when you get Dan please that going, dude, telling stories, yes. reminiscing. I mean, come on, man. You know what I mean, that, that was uh, that was yeah. it was like a comedy. It was like I feel like I should pay Dan because <laughs> yeah. how funny he how funny he is and he, was. I mean, when I mean, he he's so good. when he turns it on, man, and he's in a good mood and he's <laughs> like got that giddy flavor going he is one of the funniest human beings on a planet and it helps that he's also one of the smartest people on a planet so it makes yeah. him even funnier when he's funny and <laughs> that's what i said at the very beginning of this he is a swiss army knife he can do anything in front of a camera and be great at it in like explosive levels yeah i can listen to you two we could have just done a full one hour show where you two just talk about jim leland and i would have sat there the entire time i was dying Time. Dude, we really could have because I I had ten more stories in my head, <laughs> and I know Police Act did too. Because if you play with yeah. Leland for at least one or two years, it's an everyday a, a, everyday thing. It was so great, man. Oh yeah. man, that was great, Chinch. Oh yeah, what a great 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 show, dude. And uh, oh my god, one of my favorites. I'm, gonna, I'm so favorites. thankful because laughter is such great medicine, yeah. and I I'm I'm gonna be on a dopamine high the rest <laughs> of the day because. Because of police sex, so so I owe him, man. But Chinchy, great yeah, job, man. Great that job. was a ton of fun, brother. Um, uh, I will see you. On, I'll see you on Friday, man. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and and for everybody out there, please, we see you guys listening. We appreciate it. Share us with your friends. Share us with your companies. Whatever it takes. Yes. But hit the like us. Subscribe. Download us. Subscribe Download to us. us. Tell your friends. So we, call everybody. So we so we could keep doing the show. And if you listen, if you're listening, you 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 have to be having as much fun as yeah. we're having. Because this is a this is unbelievable. So Chichi, I love you, brother. Love you, brother. I will see you in a couple days, man.